Welcome back, geology fans. When we left off, we were asking when the Idaho Springs NICE we investigated in the last episode was uplifted and relieved of its overburden to become surface material. To answer this question, we must move to the very top of the Idaho Springs NICE, where it has a sharp contact with the formation marked on your chart as 1B. This is the fountain formation, which makes up the layered red rocks of Red Rocks Amphitheater. A close examination right above the contact shows a conglomerate, confirming this is a sedimentary material. This sharp contact has crystalline metamorphic gneiss below, sedimentary conglomerate above. This is a classic unconformity, making that conglomeratic material directly on top what we call a classic basal conglomerate. And basal conglomerates sit upon unconformities. But what kind of unconformity is this? Angular unconformities are layered beds of rock at an angle to each other. A disconformity has parallel layers above and below with an erosional contact between them, often cutting the lateral continuity of the beds below. But this is a non-conformity, which has intrusive igneous or metamorphic below, crystalline rock below, and sedimentary above. Here we have metamorphic below and sedimentary above, and this non-conformity tells of this uplift and erosion event, and so we must peer into the fountain formation and gather the data to understand its origin. Taking a closer look, we see the pieces, or clasts, inside the fountain formation are <laughs> they're just pieces of the Idaho Springs nice. When the Idaho Springs was uplifted and eroded, it eventually deposited that eroded sediment here. The intense red of this formation is from the hematite that is the main cement that helped turn the original sediment into sedimentary rock. This hematite, like the staining on the Idaho Springs gneiss, is also from the weathering of Idaho Springs biotite under an oxidizing environment. And so both the clasts of the fountain formation and its red hematite cement come from the mechanical and chemical weathering of the Idaho Springs formation, respectively. The level of oxidation of the iron indicates it was most likely deposited subaerially, under air, or exposed to the air, not underwater or underground. So our attention is drawn to land-based environments. We see the clasts within are not angular, but not quite rounded. We could say they were subangular. This would indicate that the deposited material took a trip from its original source of weathering, but not too far of a trip. The clasts are poorly sorted, and as we move up section, we see units of dark, sandy clay, quite different from the conglomeratic sections. Such poor sorting tells of a fluctuating environment of deposition. The last piece of evidence is that if you drill down below Denver, you will eventually hit the fountain formation, but it is no longer mostly conglomerate, but it's mostly fine to medium sandstone. That's not too far of a distance from where we're standing, so the energy of this system dropped off quickly. Putting it all together, this is a flashy discharge, stream-like system somewhat close to the source of weathering that quickly loses energy and is subaerial on land. This has all the markings of what we call an alluvial fan, made when a stream discharges from a mountainous source of erosion onto a flat plain. These environments tend towards flashy discharge, ranging from a calm, low flow to flash flooding. And being up near their mountains, their clasts are subangular with the largest pieces near the mountains and getting rounder and finer grained the farther out you go on the fan. With this environment as a guide, can you put the story of these two formations together? How did the Idaho Springs get here? How did the fountain formation get here? Do you see the answer? We said the Idaho Springs must be on the surface due to uplift and erosion. 
The fountain formation is directly on the Idaho Springs and was made at the surface, so this uplift and erosion must have preceded the deposition of the fountain formation. But apparently not by much, because the fountain formation is made by uplifted mountains, and its tilted appearance tells us it was deposited in a more horizontal stance before the modern Rocky Mountains. So the uplifted mountains that made the rocks of Red Rocks came before the mountains that stand above us today. Because they are tilted, they cannot have been formed by these Rocky Mountain uplift. So the sharp contact between the Idaho Springs gneiss and the fountain formation unsorted conglomerate to silt tells the story of an ancient mountain belt that once existed here. So when did these ancient mountains form? Was it 1.7 billion years ago? No, that, there was a sea then. We had a subduction zone, not mountains. Was it 1.4 billion years ago when the Idaho Springs was taken down deep enough to become nice? No, because it still needed to be uplifted and eroded in this mountain building event before us. Though there was most likely a primal set of mountains in this area when that island arc slammed onto the edge of the supercontinent of Colombia. We call that the first ancestral Rockies. We must look to the fountain formation itself for the answer of the second ancestral Rockies because the deposition of these fans took place right after that second uplift of these ancient mountains that we call the ancestral Rockies. We can't date the sediment directly as it would just give the age of the Idaho Springs formation in the clasts, but there are layers of ash in the formation which come out with a, an age around 300 million years ago. The best evidence is that these mountains began to rise 320 million years ago and was dumping a large amount of material on its flanks as alluvial fans by 300 million years ago. Now look at that nonconformity and realize what it represents. On one side is 1.7 billion year old gneiss, and on the other, 300 million year old conglomerate. So when you put your hand on this contact, it rests on 1.4 billion years of missing time. There are no fossils in metamorphic rocks, but at the time the Idaho Springs formation was being deposited 1.72 billion years ago, the only fossils found in contemporary sedimentary rocks are single-celled organisms, with the most obvious being stromatolites, which are about to hit their heyday before crashing. By the time the fountain formation is depositing, life has become multicellular and eaten up most of those stromatolites. Life has evolved the basic body plans of all modern organisms, including our class of life, the vertebrates, and even our order of life, tetrapoda, whose fossils and trace fossils are found in these very beds of rock. Fish have become amphibians, which have become reptiles, which are now diversified into several branches, including one branch of dinosaur-like reptiles, and the branch that will lead to us, which are mammal-like reptiles, or therapsids. It is at this time we see the first gymnosperms, or plants with seeds, such as the conifers, the cone-bearing plants, and most importantly, in the fountain formation, we see fully formed animals with sexual reproduction, allowing a great increase in the complexity of life. On the older side of the contact, at the time of the Idaho Springs, no sex. What a jump in time this thin, sharp contact represents. From single cells constrained to the sea to a supercontinent, vegetated with conifer trees and crawling with bugs and reptiles, it's an amazing journey across this junction. Tectonically, the right side of this contact represents the time when the supercontinent Columbia was forming as the proto-continents of Ur, Nina, and Atlantica came together along with newly formed volcanic arcs. We, on the North American continent, were on Nina, which literally is an anagram of Northern Europe, North America. In that gap in time, we see the full formation and rupture of Columbia into separate continents, which then reformed into the supercontinent Rodinia. Both Columbia and Rodinia and every continent and supercontinent up to this time were dead landscapes. No life on land, with the only obvious life being stromatolites fringing their shores. 
Rodinia then ruptured and made separate continents once again, and giving us the basic lithospheric plates of the Earth today. It was at the end of Rodinia that multicellular life evolved, and life makes an obvious claim to land before the next supercontinent can form. As the ancestral Rockies rose to deposit the fountain formation, the supercontinent Pangaea was coming to full formation. The atmospheres that these two rocks formed under was quite different as well. The atmosphere of Columbia only had about 1% oxygen in the atmosphere, compared to the 21% that we have today. When the alluvial fans of the fountain formation deposited, they were mixing with an atmosphere that came right after the Carboniferous period of the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian periods, which took carbon out of the atmosphere and replaced it with oxygen, bringing uh, the oxygen levels up to about 23% of the total volume of the atmosphere. Or another way to look at this, there was 115% of the modern concentration of oxygen for the iron released from the weathering of the Idaho Springs biotite to react with. The fountain formation is not limited in locality to Red Rocks Park, either. This rusted formation makes up the red flat irons to our north around Boulder, and it makes up the red rocks on the west side of the Garden of the Gods in Colorado Springs to our south. We shouldn't think of this as a single alluvial fan but as several fans, in fact, several fans that overlap each other to become an extensive apron of sediment at the base of the ancestral Rockies. We call this form a bajada. And our location that we're looking at here has a miniature analog of a bajada in the apron of sediment at the base of the outcrop face. If we go even further south to the Grand Canyon, down at its base, we find 1.75 to 1.73 billion year old Vishnu Schist, with a chemistry indicating it was originally an ash, mud, sand, silt mix. This rock is the same age as the Idaho Springs Nice, and Vishnu Schist was deposited in the same back arc basin that got subducted and later uplifted and eroded to make a non-conformity with the sedimentary units above. John Wesley Powell, on his trip down the Grand Canyon in 1869, called this non-conformity the Great Unconformity. And we see an extension of this Great Unconformity before us at this location. The ancestral Rockies were as large and as extensive a set of mountains as the Rockies we see before us today extending from the Grand Canyon area of Arizona all the way up into the Dakotas. In our immediate location, we can infer from the fining of grain size to the east under Denver that these ancestral Rockies were close to our west, just as the modern Rockies are today. For our lab chart, the fountain formation is Unit 1B. It has very poorly sorted grain size, ranging from over 10 centimeters to under 1 millimeter. The minerals are basically those of the Idaho Springs, quartz, caspar, biotite, hematite, but the biotite has mostly weathered out and turned to hematite cement. Quartz is no surprise here at all because it's very resistant to weathering, but potassium feldspar remaining from the Idaho Springs clasts that gives us another clue that these clasts did not erode too far or spend too much time exposed at the surface. Potassium feldspar doesn't last long in transport at the surface because it chemically weathers to clays in a geologically short time. The age of the fountain formation is 300 million years at its base, and it gets up to about 290 at the top, so this area was in D-World for 10 million years in the form of alluvial fans or a bajada. The event that we witness with this formation is the uplift and erosion of the ancestral Rocky Mountains. And with that, we feel we have a better appreciation of this site. But before we can leave, we must take a strike and dip. If we take strike and dip of the joint and fault surfaces in the Idaho Springs, which we won't do for this trip, we could get an idea of the compressive stresses that cause these structures, which are mainly associated with the uplift of the modern Rocky Mountains. We will take a strike and dip of the bedding planes of the fountain formation beds. Below you can see the values that we get, and on a map of the area, I would place a strike and dip symbol 
as follows.